Amen. This morning I want to use this thought from the message of the flesh. Lord willing, I'm going to, this is the first part, I'm going to finish up tonight in the service. I was thinking, I was getting ready to get into the message. This is something, of course, uh, the devil would rather we not spend any time on this. He doesn't want us to expose his things that he uses against people or his deceptive measures. He'd rather we didn't know that and just be deceived. And so we're going to pray that the, the Lord just helps us in studying the word and we understand the difference between the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. And so as we get ready to read these verses, we're going to begin in Galatians chapter 5. But I want us to pray and ask God to just help us to receive from the word and that the power of God will be manifested against the enemy that would like to keep us from presenting this, but it's important for us to know this so that we can know how that we ought to live as his, as his people. So, Lord, as we look to you today, we pray that you will bless and you will touch, and we pray for clarity of mind and speech, and we pray for your power, Lord, to proclaim this message and that you will move by your Holy Spirit and we pray against anything that the enemy would try to use to distract and that our hearts and minds will be open to receive from you and that we'll be strengthened by your word today as we reach out to you. And so thank you for your help today. Now in Jesus' name, amen. In Galatians chapter 5, we're going to begin reading at verse number 13. It says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. What law is he talking about? The law of the flesh. He said, you're not led. If you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murder, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> I want to stop here just a minute before we finish reading. Notice that he said, I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. People that live by these things that we just read, if that's their lifestyle, they choose to live that way, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. When we, we were shaping in iniquity and sin when we came into this world, and so we have to deal with it, and we still have self to deal with, the flesh. When we get saved, we turn our, we're no longer to be under living by the flesh, that's not our master anymore, but it's the Lord as we follow him and the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when we, we don't get rid of that, 
It'd be a lot simpler <laughs> if when we got saved, we'd just get rid of that, but we still have the flesh to deal with. And so there's going to be times in our lives that we, we allow some, one of these works of the flesh to manifest itself in our life, and not because that we want to, but once in a while we will allow something to come up or we'll react in some way that we allow the flesh to dictate to us for a little while until we realize that's not the way I ought to act. That's not the way a Christian ought to act. And so we're not talking about those things when he said, but he said, I tell you that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those that live this way and, and, you know, shaping their life this way, they're not going to enter the kingdom of God. We have to make a break from the old way and, and accept the new way. We were born again and we were made a new creature in Christ Jesus Old things pass away, behold, all things become new. We have to make a separation. We can't live by the flesh any longer. The law of the flesh is not our law any longer after we get saved. But on the other hand, as we continue reading, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. And they that are cru Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another or envying one another. Now, I want us to make two observations. The works of the flesh are destructive and hurtful. Keep that always in mind. The works of the flesh will not produce anything good. We've got to keep that in mind. Works of the flesh are destructive and hurtful. On the other hand, the fruit of the Spirit is uplifting and it produces good. It's uplifting and produces good. So, as a believer, you must guard against the works of the flesh operating in your life for they are destructive, they're displeasing to God, and since they're displeasing to God, it should not be the characteristic of a, of a Christian. Now, I want to go over those. It's interesting to notice how many are, are listed in the works of the flesh. Seventeen. And then it added, and such like. Anything else like that? A little bit like that. Whether it's listed in the 17 or not. Anything like that. The first four we're not going to take any time on. They're all regarding the wrong use of sexuality. So we're not going to deal with those. That's adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. But if you have your Bibles and you want to follow along there, if you have it open, you can follow along on these. The, next, the fifth one is uh, idolatry. That's a, that's a worship of spirits or persons or graven images, uh, anything that has... Equal or greater authority than God and his word becomes an idol. There's witchcraft as a meaning of sorcery, black magic, worship of demons, or the use of drugs to produce spiritual experiences. Hatred, that's intense, hostile intentions and acts. It's interesting to know some of these we would call terrible things. But there's some of the other things that are not listed as to the point that we would maybe put them in that same category. But notice that they're all works of the flesh. So there's hatred. Then there's variance, so that's contentions, quarreling, a struggle for superiority, emulations, jealousies, resentfulness, envy of another person's success. Wrath was one of them. That's explosive anger or rage, strife, that's selfish ambitions and seeking of power, seditions, dissensions, that's introducing devices, teaching not supported by the word of God, heresies, that's division within the congregation into selfish groups or cliques which destroy the unity of the church, and then there's envyings, that's resentful dislike of another person who has something that he desires, that one desires. 
murders, that's pretty obvious, killing a person unlawfully with malice, drunkenness, that's impairing one's mental and physical control with alcoholic drink, reveling, that's a party spirit involving alcohol, drugs, sex, or the like, and then anything else, and such like. So there's quite a list. Those are works of the flesh. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 9 through 11. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, that's homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he said, such were some of you. That's the way some of you used to live, he said, but now you've been washed. You're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. He said, that's the way some you to live, but not after you've been washed, not after you've been born again, because that's not our lifestyle anymore. That's not the way that we live. Now let's go to Romans. I want to take a little bit of time on this, and then I want to go and, get, and present a, an example from the Old Testament from this, but I want to take a little time here getting it kind of set up here. In Romans chapter 6, Verse 11. And it says, Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but rather yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin will not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. We live by a different set of guidelines than the old place that we used to live. Now, as Christians, we're not to live after the law of the flesh, but after the law of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit, remember what they are? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And those last three, faith, meekness, and temperance, has the meaning of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the law that we are to live after as children of God. Romans chapter 7. Romans 7, verse 4 through 6. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should not be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that you should be married to another, even to him that's raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve, sin, serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter." So, this pretty well tells us how we're to live and what should be in control of our life, and it's not the works of the flesh. Now, I want us to look at an example in the Old Testament. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 10, and just keep your Bible open there for the rest of the message, even though I'll have another verse or two here and there, 
If you'll just keep your Bibles open here, there'll be several places that we refer uh, in this account. This was right after Samuel had anointed uh, Saul to become king in 1 Samuel chapter 10. And he had just been anointed to be king, and, and we're going to read about some of the results. 1 Samuel chapter 10, and begin at verse 5. And that thou shalt come to the hill of God. This was right after he'd been anointed, and this was some instructions to him. He said, And thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, you will meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and you shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou shalt do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Verse 9. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they were come thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before saw that perhaps he prophesied among the prophets, that the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? So notice what happened. He'd been anointed, now the Spirit of God comes upon him, and he is answering, and he's operating by the Spirit of God. And when time comes that he's going to be installed as king, we find him in, in chapter 10 here in verse 22, it says he's hiding among the stuff. So he has a very humble beginning. He's hiding behind the stuff. They're getting ready to anoint him king, and he's hiding. A very humble beginning. He also had a band of men, it says, whose heart God has touched them. They were touched by God in verse 26. It says, and Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. He had a group of men around him. Their, their hearts had been touched as well. And then after Saul had been installed, there were some that didn't like it. They didn't, they didn't want him to be king. They didn't like him. And so in, in verse 27, it says, But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? And they despised him, and they brought him no presents. They didn't support him. They didn't like him. They didn't bring any presents. But notice what Saul, what was Saul's response? It says Saul held his peace. He held his peace. He didn't try to do anything against them because they didn't like him or because they wouldn't bring him any presents. But he just held his peace. Then they had a battle. It was the first battle with Saul being the king and the leader. And they won a real great victory that day. And some of the people reminded Saul of those people. Remember those ones that said, we don't want him. We're not going to bring any presents to him. And so, and they reminded him. They went to battle. They won this great battle. And then said, some of them reminded Saul, remember those people that doubted your ability to be king? You want to do something about them? <laughs> well, let's look in verse 11, you know, chapter 11. And 13 says, Saul says, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for the Lord has wrought salvation in Israel. Saul did not entertain the thought of retaliation. Notice verse 14. Then said Samuel to the people, Come, let us go up to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. He said, we're not going to have any retaliation against them. They can feel however they want to. We're going to go on. We're going to worship God. We're going to go up. We're going to offer sacrifices. And we're going to rejoice in the Lord. 
Uh, you don't gain anything by retaliation and revenge. You don't gain one thing. In fact, you lose. You can lose a lot that way. And uh, some things you just have to let go and go on and let God take care of those things. You know, we, we waste a lot of tr time and, and trouble a lot of times when we, we, we shouldn't, and um, we should let God have direct us. Now, keep your Bibles open there, but I want to refer to another scripture in, in Romans chapter 11 or chapter 12 because Saul was following the scripture pattern. And it tells us in Romans 12, verse 17, it says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. There's two things that the Bible says that belong to God, especially. He said, vengeance is mine and the tithe is mine. <laughs> We're not preaching about tithe, but anyway, he said, those are mine. So he said, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. He'll, I'll take care of it. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If, he, if he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, I know that sometimes that's not always easy to do. When you see someone that has wronged you or done something you don't like, you don't want to feed him, you don't want to care for him, you don't want to do anything good for him. That's the human part. And you would like to see something happen to him just because he was mean to you. That's the human part. That's the old flesh. But it says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And when you see some of these works of flesh crop up in your life and your heart, I mean, it's Christians. You have to realize it. And when you become aware of it, you said, that's not the way I ought to act. That's not a way that I ought to live as a Christian. And so you pray and you ask God to help you overcome that. I've shared with the men at one of our Bible studies downstairs a few weeks back. We've been blessed in all of our churches to have good congregations. We've had some little skiffs here and there, but God's been good. But I remember one situation where a couple of people made some pretty derogatory remarks. And I was hurt. And... Uh, but I knew, according to God's word, I had to forgive them. I could not let that stay in my heart. So I pray, oh, God, help me to overcome that, to not have any malice. Help me to be able to forgive them in my heart, to get over this. And it took a little while to get it prayed out of my system. But I got to the place where I could see those two people, and I could look at them without any desire for any malice, or any ill will to them without any feeling of ill will towards them. But I had to pray about it. I knew it wasn't right. <laughs> I'm not sure I've got this one completely prayed through, but I, it's getting better. <laughs> you all remember just since we've been here that I had that little accident. This driver in the Walmart parking lot come across and sit up, come right across in front of me, and was just there, and I could do nothing but hit him. And then, well, the officer that, the officer that came, he wrote up the ticket that we were both at fault. I was going the wrong way, and of course he gave, and I was not going the wrong way. I was going, the parking space is going this way, and I was leaving. But he wrote it up that way, and so the insurance said, well, we're, we're taking half of the blame. You'll have to pay, you know, and so on. 
and, and I talked to them. I, I went down and I talked to the officer and tried to see if he would go check it out again and see because I tried to explain the diagram he wrote was wrong, but he wasn't very interested. He said, I'll go, I'll go, I'll, maybe I'll go out and check it again and see, and then I'll call you. Well, I never heard any more from him. The insurance agent went up and talked to, called several times and finally got to him anyway. When they went and looked at the film at Walmart, it showed that I was in the right. It showed that I was driving the right way. I wasn't going the wrong way. And he said, he said, I just forgot which aisle they were that it happened in. So he wrote, but he wrote a re retraction. He wrote an amendment and was taken care of. And so uh, all fault was taken off of me and, and, and so forth. But I, I had a lot of trouble <laughs> having the wrong feeling about that officer. <laughs> Because I couldn't, you know, I couldn't get him to change it. I couldn't get him, but I had a wrong feeling. I th and I knew I can't have that kind of feeling in my heart. And so it's, it's easier since he admitted he was fault, at fault <laughs> and corrected it. But, but even if he hadn't, if I had to come to that place that I am willing to forgive him and let go of it, even though that it's not right, I can't harbor it in my heart. And so sometimes we have to do a little praying about it when we realize that that work of the flesh is not right in my life. I've got it, got it prayed out. I can't live that way. I can't operate that way. That's not the way that I'm, I'm not living after that law anymore. I'm living after the law of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is different than the works of the flesh. So that's what I've got to live after. Anyway, I didn't know I was going to pray. I didn't know I was going to throw all that in, but anyway. <laughs> now, where was I? Oh, this is about, about Saul. <laughs> well, the sad thing about Saul was that he didn't continue to follow the Bible way. And that's the sad thing. Because after a period of time, he started acting in his own direction. He started disregarding the commandments of God. And he began to operate in himself rather than be led by the Spirit. He offered sacrifices instead of waiting for Samuel the priest to come, was the one to, to do it, not him. He began making foolish decisions, like asking his soldiers not to eat when going to battle. What a silly thing to do. If you're going to have to send soldiers into the battle, you want them to, be, to eat and have strength. But he sent them out to, to war without, uh, without eating, going to battle. And that plan almost resulted in his son, Jonathan, getting killed. Then when it was God's order to destroy everything in Amalek, not only did he save some of the best things, but he lied about it to Samuel. Remember, if you remember the story, they went to Amalek, they, were all, they would destroy everything. So there were some nice-looking animals and 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 the sheep, and so forth. And so the people talked him into saving some of those. When Samuel came to confront him with it, and Saul's so big and, big and bold and, and lying all the time, oh, Samuel, I've done everything that the Lord had to, told me to do. Samuel said, now, wait a minute. I hear, I hear some sheep bleeding out here, and I, I hear some animals. What do you mean? Oh, the people just, the people decide we'd save some of those to sacrifice. Well, it finally reached the place where after David was anointed to be king in the place of Saul, that it says in chapter 16, 14, that the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And all of these actions up to this point was the start of the downfall of Saul. But the thing that really sealed his doom was this characteristic that he allowed to take over and consume him after David comes on the scene. At first, Saul was excited about having David's help. Remember after fighting with Goliath and winning, Saul was excited about having David involved. In fact, he had David to come and be his general in his army. So he's excited. They started winning battles. 
And the women came in when they always have a parade afterwards, and the women would start shouting, David has slain his 10,000 and Saul his thousands. Well, Saul so said, well, wait a minute here. They're ascribing honor and praise a lot more to David than me. The only thing left is him, for him to take over the kingdom. So he began to eye David after this, began to watch him. Well, it reached the place where jealousy, jealousy is the work of the flesh. It came to a place where jealousy took over and consumed him. It drove Saul to take the next several years to try to kill David or have him killed. And he tried it in various ways. In chapters 18 through 26 of 1 Samuel, it records all the various plans and schemes to try to do away with David. Saul was consumed with jealousy. And, note, and see what happened? He wasted years. David wasn't killed but there were a lot of innocent people that were killed during that time. Well, hold on. Just keep your Bibles open there to 1 Samuel. We'll finish up in just a little bit. But I want to read these scriptures out of Hebrews chapter 12. There's a great warning here in Hebrews chapter 12, 14 and 15. It says, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, that means you watch diligently. You pay attention diligently. Lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. We have to be on guard and watch for any of the works of the flesh that might try to pop up into our life. And so he said, looking diligently. And I want us to notice that it says, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's pretty strong. But, but he said, now look diligently, watch carefully, lest any man, watch out for this, he says, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest anyone fall by the wayside, or lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Not only are the works of the flesh poison inside of us, not only does it affect us and our relationship with God, but many others are hurt by the poison. Many others are hurt with the results of the works of the flesh. So it's not only about us and our own well-being, but it's also a concern for others. It became so bad in the life of Saul when he was facing the last battle that he would face, he went to a witch to try to find help, to find direction. He went to a witch. Now, he had been a man that the Spirit of God had worked upon him, and he had prophesied. He had, he had started out so well, but he ends up going to a witch to try to find direction and help in this battle. And I, I couldn't help but think as I was reading that and thinking about it, you don't know, you don't know how far you might go if you are led by the flesh or you're dictated to by the flesh. You don't know how far you might go. Someone said, oh, I would never do that. I would never go that far. You don't know how far you would go if you're led by the flesh and not by the Spirit of God, you just don't know. And so that's why it's important to pay close attention and not allow ourselves to be led by the works of the flesh. And so in, in 1 Samuel chapter 31, it describes that last battle. Chapter 31 of 1 Samuel. Verse 3 says, And the battle went sore against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was sore wounded of the archers. Then said Saul unto his armor bearer, Draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and abuse me. 
but his armor bearer would not, for he was sore afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise upon his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men that same day together. Now, what was David's reaction when this happened? Now, David had already been selected to be the king in Saul's place, even though it would be several years before it took place. But here David had been chased like an animal for several years. And so that's the way he had to live. He had to go run here and run there, live in the cave, run over here, do this, try to keep Saul from killing him. But David chose not to operate out of revenge or hatred or retaliation. He decided to follow God from his heart and leave revenge and justice in the hands of God. And you can read about there in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. It says, they mourned and wept and fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Verse 17, and David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son. Now remember, this is his reaction. He had been chased for years. Saul had tried to kill him for years. And now he's dead. And so what did, did David gloat about it? No, he said in verse 17, David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son. Then look at 19. The beauty of this is his part of his lamentation. The beauty of Israel is slain upon the high places. How are the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice, lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. Ye mountains of Gabor, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offering. For there the shield of the mighty is vilely cast away, the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. And I think it really speaks to the character of David. As he's lamenting over the, the death of Saul and Jonathan, he said, don't tell it. Don't, don't publish it in Gath. Don't make it something to, to publish in the front pages of the paper. Don't declare it. Don't make it a big issue, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Don't make a big issue out of it. We're going to turn this over to God. We're sorry that it's happened this way, and we're not going to give the enemy opportunity to gloat about it. We're going to have our time of, of mourning, and then we're going to do God's work. Now, today I want us to think about these three things in closing. The pattern of your life, as you think about this. The way you live and how you react to life and to others. Is it more like Saul or is it more like David? Remember, Saul ends up being a loser. David is the winner. David was commended and he was blessed by God. Saul lost the blessing of God from his life. And one of the saddest declarations, one of the saddest statements in the Bible is this one made about Saul that David finished up his lamentation. Saul died as though he had not been anointed with oil. He died as though he had not been anointed with oil. He lost it all. He gave in to the works of the flesh. He started so well, living by the law of the Spirit, but he began to live after the law of the flesh, and he ended up wasting his life without jealousy and tried to kill David, and he ended up a loser and ended up as though he had never been anointed to be king. It's a sad ending. May we be stirred in our hearts to remember how we're to live as his, as his children. 
the fruit, of, the fruit of the Spirit are the characteristics of Christ and what should be in control of our lives as a Christian, the fruit of the Spirit. That's the way we want to live, not by the law of the flesh, but by the law of the Spirit. Amen. We can be a winner or we can be a loser. The flesh, nothing good ever comes out of the flesh. The works of the flesh never produce any good. Never. The fruit of the Spirit will, but not the works of the flesh. So we don't want to live after that. That's not our way of life. And if should, should we allow some of that flesh, some of those things to pop up in our life, we need to realize this is the work of the flesh. It's not the way that I'm supposed to live and I'm going to pray until I get victory over this because that's not the way that I'm to live as a child of God. Amen. Turn, if you will, in your psalm book to page 181. The song says, Stepping in the light, trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, Shaping our lives by his blessed example. Happy how happy the songs that we bring. We want to be led by the Spirit of God and follow after Christ and not by the works of the flesh. We're probably just saying one, three, and four, okay? Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior trying to follow our savior and king shaping our lives by his blessed example happy how happy the songs that we bring how beautiful to walk in the steps of the savior stepping in the light stepping in the light how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithful mercy and love. Looking to Him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy, our journey above. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, Upward, still upward, we'll follow our guide. When we shall see him, king in his beauty, happy, how happy our place at his side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Amen. Could we stand together this morning? Hey. Can we do a little self-examination this morning and think about how we choose to live our life? And I, when I read over these scriptures and looked at them, I, Thought, boy, that, you know, it says that those that live that way shall not inherit the kingdom of God. It makes it down pretty plain. We just can't live that way. If we're going to, if we expect to go to heaven, we can't live that way. 
And so that's why that we have to pray, Lord, help me to live by the fruit of the Spirit. May the fruit of the Spirit control my life, not the works of the flesh. And if those things pop up in our life and we give in to some works of the flesh and we realize it and we see that what's happening, Lord, I, this is not right. I pray for your help to get over this and make it right because I don't want to live this way. I know it's not right. It's not pleasing to you. And I want to walk in ways to honor you and please you and to walk after the fruit of the Spirit. And, uh, and so that's the way I want to live. And so that's the way that we need to determine in our life that we're going to follow the Lord and not have to work to the flesh. Lord, as we look to you today, as we stand before you, I pray that we'll be willing to examine our hearts and our lives to see how that we operate so much of our life. Is it more led by the flesh or led by the Spirit? Lord, may it be our heart's desire to live after the fruit of the Spirit, your characteristics, that we might live in ways to honor you and please you, in ways to, to adorn the gospel. Lord, to make it appealing. Lord, that we might live at peace as, as possible with all men and walk in holiness before you because we want to see you one day. We want to be with you one day. We don't walk in, want to walk in ways that dishonor you and brings disgrace to your name, but we want to lift up your name. And Lord, help us. Help us to be wise. Help us to be watchful. And when we see those things pop up in our life that we'll pray through, we'll get, we'll get those out of our heart and our life and our mind that we don't want to live that way, but we want to honor you with our life. But that our life will bear fruit for you and be a good representative of you in this world. Lord, we commit ourselves to you and we want to serve you and honor you and, uh, and lift up your name. Each of us, Lord, as we live our lives and we commit it to you now in your precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Joe.